Moving on to the next case, which is filed by the Central Public Information Officer of the Supreme Court versus the noted RTI activist Subhash Chandra Agarwal. The present case arises out of the three appeals filed by the Central Public Information Officer of the Supreme Court of India against the three applications of Mr. Subhash Chandra Agarwal. He had filed three applications seeking information from the Central Public Information Officer about the correspondences related to, to the three basic points. The first one was with regard to the appointment of judges. The second one was with regard to the information on the declaration of assets from the judges. And the third one was with regard to the copy of a letter with the Chen Chief Justice of India about a news item published in a prominent newspaper about an allegation of a union minister to have reached out to a judge to influence his decisions. In all these three applications, the CPIO rejected to furnish the information, but the Central Information Commission directed the CPIO to, inform, to furnish the information. Different courts of appeals followed in these three applications. The present appeal was filed by the CPIO and court considering the appeals came up with the issues. The first issue was whether Subhash Chandra Agarwal had the right to seek information under Section 2J of the Right to Information Act. Second, whether the information sought is exempted under Section 81J of the Right to Information Act. The third one is whether the information sought is in the interest of the public or does it hamper the privacy. Fourth, whether the information was held by the judges in the fiduciary capacity. Fifth one, whether the disclosure of information would result in, in hampering the independence of the judiciary. <clears throat> Looking at the issues raised, the parties in the case raised their respective contentions and the appellant contended that the disclosure of information would impede the independence of judiciary. The other side argued that the disclosure of information would strengthen the independence of judiciary and promotes transparency and openness. The second contentions as raised by the appellant was that they contended that the right to information is not an exclusive right and there are many exceptions to it as provided under Section 8 of the Right to Information Act. The contention of the respondent was that the disclosure of information would serve as a larger public interest and due to the nature of information sought as it will outweigh the privileges of exemption granted. <laughs> Appellant also contended that the information is declared by the judges in fiduciary capacity and the consultations made between the Chief Justice of India and the constitutional functionaries are made on the basis of trust which are meant to be protected and confidential and it is not for the public consumption. The other side contended that there exists no fiduciary relationship as a public servant is not to act for the benefit of another and the judges are meant to discharge their constitutional duties and not to act as fiduciary of anyone. The applicability of SP Gupta case was also discussed by the parties and the appellant mentioned that the SP Gupta case does not have a direct bearing on the present matter. The respondent contended that the SP Gupta case had a direct bearing, although the facts are slightly different, but due to the decision of the court with respect to the disclosure of information in respect of the appointment process of the judges. Based on the contentions, <clears throat> the court decided based on the reasoning that for answering whether Subhash Chandra Agarwal had the right to information or not, the court had to analyze clauses of section 2, that is clause F, I and J, and along with other sections. Upon reading the definition of the word information, the court concluded that the information is defined as broad and wide and it includes material in any form. Further, they said that such information should be accessible by the public authority and held by or under the control of public authority. The meaning of the term hold and under control of any public authority was also discussed and how section 22 of the helps of the act helps to remove the prohibitions in any prior act. <clears throat> Reliance was placed on Aditya Bandopadhyaya case and to understand what information falls and what not under the right to information regime. The information uh, is of three types. Firstly, that promotes transparency and accountability, which means it relates to information under Section 4.1b. Secondly, 
the, the information that is held by the public authority as classified under section 41c and lastly those information which is not held by or under the control of the public authority and it is only the last kind of information that is excluded from the right to information. Although such information is restricted and it is not absolute, such restrictions are laid down under section 8 to 11 of the right to information act. But despite such restrictions, the information may be furnished if it serves the greater public interest. The decision has to be made in such a position by applying the doctrine of public interest. That is, the test of public interest has to be propounded and it has to be understood. It is important that the public interest should outweigh any possible harm or injury to the interest of third party if the disclosure has to be made. Issue of such fiduciary relationship was also discussed and decided based on the case of Aditya Bandopadhyaya as I already mentioned above. <coughs> fiduciary relationship flows from section 8.1 E of the Right to Information Act and it means persons who act in fiduciary capacity with reference to a specific beneficiary or beneficiaries who are expected to be protected or benefited by the action of such fiduciary relationship. The court reasoned in this case that the relationship between the Chief Justice and judges is not of a fiduciary and beneficiary as they do not satisfy the four conditions set out to classify the relationship as a fiduciary relationship which are the first one should be the no conflict rule, the second one should be the no profit rule, the third one is the undivided loyalty rule and the fourth one is the duty of confidentiality. Another competing issue that the court resolved with the right to know was the right to privacy and the court opined that the right to know has to be harmonized with the need for personal privacy and confidentiality of information. Section 81J and Section 11 of the Right to Information Act puts restriction on the information that may result into invasion of privacy of the individual and when information has been supplied by the third party has been treated as confidential by such third party. But if you look at the present case, the court applied the test of proportionality and said that the RTI Act also defined the legitimate aim that is one of the requirements laid down in the Puttaswamy judgment. <clears throat> the legitimate aim in the Right to Information Act is the public interest in dissemination of such information which can be private or confidential but the larger public interest should always outweigh any possible harm or injury to the third party. So, the right to protect identity or anonymity is subject to the public interest test as the public concern relates to matters as an integral part of the freedom of speech and expression. Then how should we understand the term public interest? As has been perceived under the right to information, access to any information to something that is in the interest or for the benefit of the public, even the independence of judiciary is a matter of public concern and it is directly related to the public welfare. So the public interest test has to be applicable based on these reasons. Amongst other reasons, the court has decided that the test of public interest would have to be applied in order to decipher whether the information has to be furnished or not. <clears throat> the court also upheld the judgments of the High Court regarding the declaration of assets and it was only restricted to that, which reasoned out that it does not impinge upon the right to privacy of the judges and the fiduciary relationship is not applicable. With regard to the other appeals that was filed with regard to the appointment or with regard to the correspondences as mentioned about influencing a judicial officer, the Supreme Court of India allowed the matter and remanded the matter back to the Information Commission after following the procedure under Section 11 of the Right RTI Act. The next case which I would like to discuss is about the Chief Information Commissioner versus the High Court of Gujarat. This is a case that was decided by the Supreme Court of India on the 4th of March 2020. The facts of this case are something like this. An RTI application was filed seeking information pertaining to some of the cases with all the relevant documents and certified copies. 
In reply to the RTA application, the Public Information Officer of the Gujarat High Court informed that for obtaining required copies, the applicant should file an application personally or through his advocate by affixing the required court stamp fees and with the requisite fee addressed to the deputy registrar. The applicant who is not a party to the case had to go through a special procedure wherein he had to separately file an affidavit mentioning the reason why such application has to be maintained and the judgment is required. His application should be accompanied by the affidavit stating the grounds for which the certified copies are required and on making such application he will be supplied with the certified copies of the documents as per the rules prevailing under the respective High Court rules and in this case being the Gujarat High Court rules of 1993. The Supreme Court considering these issues framed few issues and the issues are pertaining to the applicability or whether the rule 151 of the Gujarat High Court stipulating that providing copy of documents to the third parties and the requirement to file an affidavit stating the reasons suffers from any inconsistencies with the provisions of the Right to Information Act. Secondly, when there are two machineries to provide information or certified copies, one under the High Court rules and another under the Right to Information Act, in the absence of any inconsistency, whether the provisions of the RTI Act can be resorted to for obtaining the certified copy. The parties in this case argued vehemently and they also contended several positions and also they cited several cases. I'll mention some of the contentions that were advanced by the parties. The appellant contended that under the section 6 of the right to information, it provides specifically that an applicant making a request for information shall not be required to give reason for requesting the information sought and whereas the Gujarat High Court rule made the parties to seek information only by filing an affidavit stating the reason as to why the judgment or the copy of the court orders has to be supplied. There is a direct inconsistency between the provisions of the Right to Information Act and the Gujarat High Court rules of 1993. The inconsistency between the provisions of the Right to Information Act and the Gujarat High Court rules there cannot be a harmonious construction between the two and in the event of conflict, the provisions of the Right to Information Act or any other law made by the Parliament or the State Legislature has to prevail. The appellant also submitted that the Section 22 of the Right to Information Act specifically provides that the provision of the Right to Information Act will have an overriding effect over any other laws which are prevailing. Further, if you read Section 6 Clause 2 of the Right to Information Act, it grants a substantive right and the person who is seeking information or copies is not required to give any reason and this right cannot be curtailed by the procedural laws framed down by the High Courts. Well, the power to frame rules has been derived from Article 225 of the Constitution of India and the High Courts as the constitutional authorities have been granted this power. Well, looking at the contentions raised by the respondent, the application procedure as stipulated under the Gujarat High Court rules and since the respondent or the party who was seeking application was not a party to the proceedings, he was informed that the application shall be accompanied with an affidavit stating the grounds for which the certified copies are required. If you look across Efficacious remedy is already available under Rule 151 of the Gujarat High Court rules, which is in consonance with the provisions of the Right to Information Act. The provisions of the Right to Information Act cannot be invoked and the High Court rightly held that there is no question of making an application under the RTI Act and rightly quashed the order of the appellant, who is the Chief Information Commissioner. The assistance of the amicus curiae was also taken in this case and there were some arguments which was also advanced by the amicus curiae which I'll just make a mention. The first contention that was mentioned was third parties that is who are 
persons or parties not uh, not a litigant in the case is also or can also apply for seeking copies from the high courts or the lower courts provided he files an affidavit that is the third party affidavit mentioning the reasonable grounds as to why the information is required. He also stated that there is no inconsistency between the Right to Information Act and the rules framed by the High Courts. If you look at Section 22 of the Right to Information Act, it has an overriding effect over any other laws. In case there are inconsistencies, Section 22 of the RTI Act does not contemplate to override those legislations which aim to ensure access to information. Information on the judicial side of the High Court and the rules framed by the High Court provide for dissemination of information and not that there are any conflicting provisions about the requirements. The only requirement is that the applicant who is not a party to the case has to file with requisite fees and with appropriate reasons as to why he has he is seeking the information. Insofar as furnishing the certified copies to the third parties, the rules framed by the High Court stipulate that the certified copies of the documents, orders or judgments or copies of proceedings would be furnished to the third parties only on the orders passed by the court registrar and upon being satisfied about the reasonable cause or bona fide of the reasons seeking the information, certified copies of the documents will be supplied. Well, based on the contentions raised and the arguments of the parties, the court also held that the information under categories so as sought by the applicant on the judicial side can be accessed by way of seeking certified copies of the documents and orders could be obtained by the parties to the proceedings in terms of the High Court rules. And the parties to the proceedings are also entitled to the same. Insofar as the third parties are concerned, as of right, they are not entitled to seek information about a judgment to which they are not a party. But there is a provision that is there in the High Court rules which provides that a third party can also obtain the certified copies of the documents, orders or judgments and can have access to information upon filing an application or affidavit by stating the reason for which the information or copies of documents are required. One can access the information or copies of the documents through the rules framed by the High Courts or under the rules framed by the High Courts under the Right to Information Act. Well, if you see the information held by the right to by the high court relating to the parties to the litigation proceedings pleadings documents and other materials are supposed to be confidential documents which is submitted to the court orders and judgments passed by the koha courts or specifically the high court as a matter of record is a public record and is already available in the public domain in exercise of the power of superintendence over the courts tribunals and information received in the records submitted or called for by the courts and tribunals. The High Courts can seek information and can also procure some of the documents which are relevant to it. Information on the administrative side of the High Court pertaining to the appointments, transfers and posting of the judicial officers, staff members and of the district judiciary, the actions taken against the judicial officers and the staff members, such other information relating to judicial work has to be kept confidential. Uh, information again on the administrative side as to the decisions taken by the Collegium of the High Court in making recommendations of the judges to be appointed to the High Court, information as to the assets of the sitting judges held by the Chief Justice of the High Court and other information can be classified under the personal information. And thus it can be called for the exemption and any applicant any applicant seeking information may be refused to be granted such information as per the clause mentioned under Section 8. Well, the information held by the court on the judicial side is the personal information of the litigants like title cases and the family court matters, etc. Under the guise of seeking information under the Right to Information Act, the process of the court is not to be abused and the information must not be misused. Based on these contentions and the arguments, the Supreme Court held that the rule framed by the High Courts to have access to information obtaining certified copies by the third parties, which requires the parties to mention the reasons for seeking information 
is not consistent with the provisions of the RTI Act, but merely lays down a different procedure as the practice or payment of fees, etc. for obtaining information. In the absence of any inherent inconsistency between the provisions of the Right to Information Act and any other law, the RTI Act would not become applicable. The information of certified side, certified copy which can be accessed on the judicial side has to be obtained through a proper mechanism as prescribed under the rules. And it also concludes that there is no inconsistency between the Right to Information Act and the court rules. This is factually incorrect because the Gujarat High Court rules, unlike the RTI Act, require the submission of an affidavit stating the purpose, seeking copies of the pleadings and the right to information requires no reason provided to seek information. The other point which has to be noted here that the court considered that a special enactment or rule cannot be held to be overridden by a later general enactment simply because the latter open up with a non upstand clause and unless there is a clear inconsistency between the two legislations, the latter legislation cannot just prevail. The other important point that has to be noted here is that the rules framed by the High Court under Article 225 is a special rule and it is a special law which provides for the right to information and does not take away the right per se. Whereas Right to Information Act is more of a general law and it has certain exemptions already carved in to protect some of the confidential information and exemptions as provided under Section 8. The next case which I would like to discuss is of the Union Public Service Commission versus Angesh Kumar which was decided by the Supreme Court of India on 20th of February 2018. The facts of this case is simple and this is how it goes. Angesh Kumar filed several applications seeking information about the UPSC preliminary examination that is conducted and to release the list of unsuccessful candidates and also with regard to some other details of the unsuccessful candidates of the UPSC preliminary examination. He approached the High Court for a direction to the UPSC to disclose details of the marks awarded to them in the civil service examination. This included information in the form of cutoff marks for every subject, scaling methodology, model answers and complete result of all candidates. Based on these applications and the petition, the High Court directed the Union Public Service Commission to disclose the marks within a period of 15 days. Aggrieved by this order, the UPSC decided to appeal the present case and it approached the Supreme Court. It was contended that the High Court has not correctly appreciated the scheme of Right to Information Act and the other prevailing decisions that are binding. Though Section 3 and 6 of the Right to Information Act confers the right to seek information, there are certain exemptions provided under Section 8, 9 and 11 from giving information as stipulated there, under that where information is likely to conflict with the other public interest, including efficient operation of the government, optimum use of fiscal resources and preservation of confidentiality, some sensitive information can be excluded from being provided. Whereas, Angesh Kumar, who was the respondent in the present case, <coughs> contended that a clear distinction of marks, cutoffs and other rankings should be made easily available to promote transparency in the education system. The court, based on these contentions, held that the third recital of the preamble of the Act, you can clearly see that it is, an imp it is important to strike balance between the transparency and the accountability, whereas the requirement of optimum use of fiscal resources and maintenance of confidentiality of sensitive information has to be also balanced. This has been provided under Section 8 of the Right to Information Act, where it balances the two conflicting rights. The court also relied on the case of Central Board of Secondary Education 
versus Aditya Bandopadhyaya, which was decided in the year 2011. And it stated that it is difficult to differentiate between the information that is in the public interest or not. It was also observed in the judgment that indiscriminate and impractical demands or directions under the Right to Information Act for disclosure of all and sundry information which are not at all related to the transparency and accountability in the functioning of the public authorities and eradication of the corruption would be counterproductive as it will adversely affect the efficiency of the administration and result in the executive getting bogged down with the non-productive work of collecting and furnishing the information. The court referred to certain problems that can be caused out of releasing the evaluated answer sheets. The court also specifically cited that the integrity of the education system will be questioned due to several processes a single mark sheet goes through. There is a certain cycle which a mark sheet goes through and the award given by the initial examiner can be struck down and reevaluated due to several reasons such as totaling errors. As a relative merit is looked at and not absolute merit system, a feeling of the initial marks being good and being relatively badly could taint the trust in the education system. There will be a danger in coaching institutes collecting copies through several repetitions. Masking of all the initial of any examiners will be logistically extremely difficult, but without which there will be a rift created between the education board and the examiners. The court was of the strong belief that mechanically producing UPSC marks would create a larger problem of confidentiality and there are chances of the sensitive personal information being released to the, inform to the public. Furnishing of information in general is not considered in public interest. The court, however, clearly pointed out that if a case is made where such marks can be seen as in the public interest, then the marks shall be revealed through the RTI Act. There are also several other reasons why the, the reasons for the UPSC to not disclose such marks of the unsuccessful candidates subsequent to the completion of the examination. Well, all this has to be looked at and the interest of the public should be considered and it is the paramount in all cases. Next case which I would like to discuss to understand the present context of exemption of information is of Rakesh Kumar Gupta versus the Public Information Officer, Life Insurance Corporation of India. The brief facts of the case are something like this. The applicant filed an RTI application in the year 2011 before the regional manager at the Life Insurance Corporation seeking detailed information about all the key man insurance policies taken in the Northern Zone and related to the assignment of such policies in favor of key men or other people in a specified Excel sheet in a DVD or as well as in the email. The applicant also further specified the need for the information of over 20 years and relied on Section 8 Clause 3 of the 2005 Act for the same. The applicant clearly also claimed public interest based on the references drawn about an audited balance sheet of Escorts Limited for the year 2002 and 3, alleging that such key men insurance policies led to tax frauds and also siphoning of money by the management to the detriment of the shareholders. This information as sought by the applicant was denied by the Chief Information Public Officer, stating that the information asked for is in fiduciary nature as it relates to contracts between the organizations and the Life Insurance Corporation. He also pointed out that the bulkiness of the information relating to key man insurance policies and there are more than four crore insurance policies and collating them would result in disproportionate diversion of resources and therefore it shall stand exempted under section 7 clause 9 of the right to information act aggrieved by the refusal of the information from being granted the applicant filed the first appeal and the same appeal also got upheld and the order of the information officer was upheld. The second appeal was also filed to the Central Information Commission while placing reliance on Bhagat Singh for the interpretation of the exception clauses. It has to be seen that during the hearing, both the parties agreed to refine the searches and the number of information that was sought was reduced to lakhs. 
The appellant also alleged that at the point of assignment, the key man insurance policy, no taxes are paid on the difference between the surrender value and the fair value at the time of assignment. This leads to the tax evasion and at this juncture, the appellant also was agreeable to obtain all of this data which have been received to this stage if the respondent furnishes in the form of a CD. A similar, another similar application was filed with the regional manager seeking detailed information of the southern zonal offices. The applicant sought the same conditions and the CPIO once again denied the information. Again, in the first appeal, the order of the CPIO was upheld and the second hearing also was undertaken. In this case, the respondent was able to justify the task of being enormous and difficult one and also raised a contention of the information being exempted under Section 8 Clause 1D of the Right to Information Act. Thereafter, thereafter the applicant once again filed another Right to Information application, this time with the Central Zone Office. The same information was again sought from the office and the CPIO again once again denied the information and it was stated that the policyholder database does not have any provision of identification for key man policies. The CPIO also sought exemption invoking Section 8 Clause 1E stating that the fiduciary relationship with the policyholders. The first appeal followed with the contention that the CPIO had wrongly invoked Section 8 1E and Section 7 Clause 9 of the Right to Information Act. However, the appellate authority also upheld the order in this case as well. This time, Rakesh Kumar Gupta approached the Central Information Commission and in the second appeal, he relied on the Bhagat Singh case and the enactment of the act is to basically promote transparency and arrest corruption and to hold the government liable for its actions. And therefore, access to information under Section 3 of the Right to Information Act and the exemption shall be ruled out. Section 8 being a restriction on this fundamental right must therefore be strictly construed and it should not be interpreted in a manner to shadow the very right itself. The applicability of the aforesaid decision has not been established in the case. The appellant further reiterated that his contention as per provision or exemption contained in 8 clause 3 of the Right to Information Act and that he should be allowed to access the information. Since some of the information may relate to the policies which may have commenced 20 years before the date on which any request is made under Section 6. He further argued that the information that should be provided to him is in the greater interest of the public and the disclosure outweighs the harm of the protected interests. The authority that is the Public Information Officer of the Life Insurance sought exemption from disclosure of information as the information belonged to the third party, namely the companies or organizations, since LIC stood in fiduciary relationship with the companies or organizations. Thus, the information was debarred from disclosure on both the counts as it is belonging to the third party. The aspect of fiduciary relationship was also brought in because LIC was standing as in the fiduciary capacity to the other companies. The commission held that the information sought after is generated by the public authority and are therefore public information, but it cannot be called inform confidential information that has been supplied to the Life Insurance Corporation. The commission, in order to get a clearer picture of the key man insurance policies, explored the meaning of the term and noted that a key man is described as an insurance policy taken out by a business company to compensate that business for the financial losses that would arise from the death or extended incapacity of the member of the business specified in the policy. Key man insurance does not indemnify the actual losses incurred but compensates with a fixed monetary sum as specified in the insurance policy. An employer may take out a key insurance policy on the life or health of any employee whose knowledge, work or overall contribution is considered uniquely valuable to the company. Anybody with specialized skills whose loss can cause a financial strain to the company are eligible for key man insurance. The commission believes that it is imperative that all efforts are made by the companies 
organizations to ensure that the key intellectual capabilities, technical expertise, skills, knowledge, and other entrepreneurial vision of the key man are to be retained by them. The commission held that by no stretch of imagination can this commercially confident information sought about key man policies by the appellant be considered as disclosable by LIC, as it is a public authority under the Right to Information Act. This commercially confident information is exempt from the disclosure under Section 8 Clause E as the Supreme Court's observation is that the relationship between LIC and the company's organization is held to be fiduciary in nature and since the beneficiaries have trusted the company to protect the commercially confident information being held by LIC, it cannot become a part of the public domain. However, it was also contended that the Section 8 Clause 3 negates the function of Section 8 Clause 1 E of the Right to Information Act and therefore exemption of fiduciary relations cannot be sought by the respondent to deny information which is more than 20 years old. The respondents also agreed to share the closed accounts which have matured 20 years ago but they also explained that the information about policies which had matured 20 years ago if indeed they still exist has to be compiled manually from crores of records and this was literally not feasible. Further, there was also a contention that invoking Section 8 Clause 2 of the RTI Act that in the instant case the LIC should allow him to access information since the public interest in disclosure outweighs the harm to the protected interest. The Commission believes that the arguments of the appellant are vague and not substantial enough. That Further, the information that is sought need not be disclosed since the public interest involved in disclosure of information has not been convincingly established and it also relied on the UK's Freedom of Information Act. The Commission decided that the respondent agreed during the hearing that a duly notarized affidavit on a non-judicial stamp paper containing the format being used for the computer generated information as available on the official website of the respondents has to be provided to the authority. Based on this, the matter got dismissed and the information that was sought by the applicant was refused from being disclosed. The next case which I would like to discuss is another interesting one with regard to the Bihar Public Service Commission versus Sayyid Hussain, Abbas Rizvi and another. Let me explain the background and the facts in brief of the case. The Bihar Public Service Commission published an advertisement to fill up certain posts for the government of Bihar. The advertisement stated that the written examination would be held if there are adequate number of applications. As there were very limited number of applications, the commission in terms of advertisement decided against the holding of a written examination. It excised the option to select the candidates for appointment to the set post on the basis of Viva Vasi test alone. The commission also recommended and completed the process of selection and recommended the panel of selected candidates to the state of Bihar. One applicant or in the present case the applicant who is Syed Hussain Abbas Razvi filed an application before the Bihar Public Service Commission under the Right to Information Act, seeking information in relation to provide the names, designation and addresses of the subject expert present in the interview board. The BPSC did not supply the information by invoking the provisions of Section 8, Clause 1G of the Right to Information Act. The respondent filed an appeal as he was aggrieved by the decision and before the State Information Commission, who directed the Bihar Public Service Commission to make available the names, designation and addresses of the subject expert present in the interview board. Agreed from the order of the State Information Commission, BPSC again challenged the same before the High Court, single bench partner who dismissed the writ petition. Agreed by the said order of the single judge, Bihar Public Service Commission challenged the order of the single judge before the division bench of Patna High Court. The division bench also took a view that the provision of Section 8 of the RTI Act are not attracted and it directed the Bihar Public Service Commission 
to provide the names of the members of the interview board. The Bihar Public Service Commission challenged the legality and correctness of the said judgment and filed an appeal before the Honorable Supreme Court. The Honorable Supreme Court also held that the disclosure of names, address and the members of the interview board would prima facie endanger the lives or safety of those persons. The possibility of a failed candidate attempting to take revenge from such persons cannot be ruled out. On the one hand, it is likely to expose the members of the interview board to harm and on the other hand, such disclosure would serve no fruitful, much less any public purpose. The view of the High Court in the judgment under appeal that the element of bias can be traced and would be crystallized if only the names and addresses of the examiners are furnished is without any substance. The Honorable Supreme Court also set aside the division bench judgment of the Patna High Court and held that the Bihar Public Service Commission is not bound to disclose the names, designation and addresses of the subject expert present in the interview board. The Supreme Court set aside the judgment of the division bench and held that the Bihar Public Service Commission is not bound to disclose the names and addresses of the subject expert in the interview board. The next case which I would like to discuss is of Union of India versus Pramod Kumar Jain. The facts of the case is something like this. The respondent, by way of application, sought information from the chief, the chief information officer of the Department of Personal and Training. The information that was sought by the applicant was regarding the copies of the proceedings and notings of the proceedings from the stage of constitution of DPC up to the stage of issue of panel bringing out the cause of omission of certain names including that of the applicant from the approved panel for promotion from chief engineer from the additional chief engineer to the grade of chief engineer. This was in the vacancies as arose that in the MES of the Ministry of Defense against the vacancy for the year 2007 and 2008. The other issue was the question or the query that raised was why the panel consisted of only seven officers whereas the vacancies were only were 10. Further, out of the seven officers included in the main panel, only three officers are retiring during the year 2007 8 then why the panel was extended for five officers. The query raised by the applicant was declined by the CPIO and because on the ground that the privilege of exemption under section 8 clause 1 of the right to information. Act. The respondent preferred the appeal before the first appellate authority and it passed the order also again upholding the order of the CPIO to not furnish the information by giving the reason that the papers pertaining to the deliberation on the appointment committee of the cabinet on the issue of promotion are cabinet papers and they cannot be treated as materials for decision of council of ministers under proviso to section 8 clause 1 of the RTI Act. The applicant who being aggrieved preferred the first appeal and also preferred the second appeal before the chief information commission. The Chief Information Commission directed the disclosure of information and relied on the case of P.D. Khandelwal versus DOPT. The Union of India, being aggrieved by the order of the Chief Information Commission, filed the case before the Delhi High Court and the matter was decided accordingly. The High Court disposed of the petition and directed the appellant to disclose the information and said that the information that would be made available to the respondents should include the reasons for the decision taken by the committee. Further, the material on the basis of which the decision was taken need not be disclosed, but if the respondent seeks such information, it can be disclosed only after a decision taken by the Council of Ministers is implemented. And if such decision constitutes advice of ministers to the president, it cannot be accused under the Right to Information Act. The reason for passing this decision are basically on the grounds that the prohibition for a limited time for non-disclosure of any information is only restricted. That is, it lasts only till a decision is taken by the Council of Ministers 
till the matter is complete or over. If you look across the proviso to remove the ban on disclosure after the decisions are taken by the Council of Ministers. Therefore, the decision of the committee in the matter of promotion of a government servant does not constitute as an advice to the ministers to the president within the meaning of Article 74 of the Constitution of India. And therefore, there was an order by the High Court of Delhi to release or disclose such information. The last and the final case which I have taken up for discussing is that of the disclosure of information relating to the income tax returns filed by an individual. This is a case pertaining to the disclosure of such information and whether or not it constitutes as personal information. It was in this case of Naresh Trehan versus Rakesh Kumar Gupta that the applicant sought information who is also stated to be an informer to the income tax department had filed an application under the Right to Information Act with the public information officer seeking information and all records of the nine assessees for different years with Dr. Naresh Trehan who is the petitioner being one of them. Upon receiving the information or the query, the Central Public Information Officer sent notices to these assessees and directed them to make the representation and adhere to the application. But the respondents objected to the disclosure of such information. Thereafter, the information officer also rejected the application on the ground that the applicant wasn't able to assert the public interest involved in revelation of the information related to the third party. The applicant appealed before the Central Information Commission and it was held by the Central Information Commission that the revelation of information of income tax return and also related information of the assessment of the income is in the public interest as it would substantiate or could increase the public revenue and will also be helpful in reducing corruption and the information commission subsequently directed for the disclosure of the information. The assessees have challenged this judgment before the Delhi High Court on the ground that the income tax return and the other related information which is provided by the assessees during the course of assessment would be protected under the Right to Information Act and the relevant applicable provision would be section 81d 81e and section 81j of the information of the information act the court in this case analyzed the issue that whether the chief information commissioner had misdirected itself in coming to the decision of making petitioner to disclose the information of the income tax filing and other related information further whether such information was in the public interest or the judge in this case concluded that the CIC had itself misled as there was no substantial proof to indicate that the petitioner or the authorities were not performing their work diligently. The court also concluded that the disclosure of information has no direct bearing or discernible element of public interest and this had to be set aside and the order of the CIC was eventually set aside. The court also rejected that there existed any fiduciary relationship between the parties. Income tax returns of a person, of any person is held to be personal information and this cannot be exempted, this is an exempted information to the third parties, thus attracting the clauses mentioned under section 81J. However, exemption could be also negated as per section 11 clause 1 and section 8 clause 2 of the information if it is in the greater public interest, but in the present case, the appellant failed to establish the larger public interest and the assessment proceedings are not public proceedings. CIC, that is the Chief Information Commission, had wrongly directed the petitioner to disclose the information and on this ground itself, the application or the, app or the case was allowed. Therefore, the information that was, that was directed to be allowed was held to be personal information and is classified as protected under Section 8 Clause 1J of the Right to Information Act. Thank you.